Good morning, Lighthouse family, those of you that are with us online and, and around here. So that song that we just started with was kind of haunting, wasn't it? I chose it especially because, well, we're living in some haunting times, aren't we? Uh, we just heard that uh, San Joaquin County is locking down. Southern California is locking down. Um, that's scary. Um, it's affecting all of our lives. It's affecting us as a church. Uh, just in the news this morning, several uh, restaurants in Sacramento are going to shut their doors not to reopen. But it's not just that, is it? Uh, there is uncertainty in global warming. There is uncertainty politically. And so what I wanted to do this morning is, is go back to part of, of our tradition in the Judeo-Christian tradition of lament. And lament just doesn't mean bad news. It means we're honest about our situation. We're honest about our need. And so what I wanted to do is start with just a few verses from Psalm chapter 6, which is a, a, a very succinct lament. O oh God, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint. O oh Lord, heal me. And we could just as easily turn that into a plural. O oh God, heal us. For our bones are in agony, our souls are in anguish. How long, O oh Lord? How long? Turn, O oh Lord, and deliver us. So that's where I'd like to start today. We're not going to spend all of our time there, but I think it's an appropriate place for us to begin. We're honest about the world as we know it. All of us are saying we can't wait to have 2020 done. Um, God, we... We know that we are facing physical problems. We know that we are facing spiritual and moral problems. And we want to just sit with our situation before you. So before I pray, I want you to watch one more song, one more video, just to kind of prepare us for this morning. And it is called simply Lament. Please lament with me. I 
Last Thursday, uh, I was talking with a friend of mine over on Zoom. Uh, he's from Germany. He is the managing director of three different companies in Shanghai. Uh, and I got to know Bernd when we were in India. And every once in a while, we talk about what he sees from, from his vantage point in another part of the world. And he said, he said, Phil, we're looking on and... He goes, I don't think you realize that how all the world is watching America right now. And he said, it, it feels to us like uh, the sun is setting on America. And he goes, you understand that I don't mean that in a way of being critical, right? And I said, I, I understand that, Vern. And he said, the other thing I don't think that you realize is that America, uh, the rest of us, we're depending on you. And America needs to be good. Whoa. You're sitting there and you're hearing somebody say that who is for you. They are a friendly critic. And it brings me back to if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. And that's not about power. I think it's about spiritual influence. And when God said that originally, it was to the Jewish people of my people. And America is not Israel, but I think that God's given us a heritage. So what I want to do today is I want to start with an invocation and a pastoral prayer for us that we would humble ourselves 
that we would let go of any sins that we know of, that we could be the people of God together here in Lighthouse, and then the impact of that would radiate out. So uh, I'm going to pray. As soon as I'm done praying, we're going to reset the tone of the morning a little bit. We're going to show you something that I'm sure is going to bring back a lot of, of I think, some fun memories. But even, even that, um, well, I'll explain that a little later. I'll, I'll, I'll hold back on that. Let me pray. Father, we humble ourselves. We lament. We are living in a time period when... Uh, pandemic has fallen on all the world. But it's especially potent in our country right now, in our lives. Several of us <coughs> in our fellowship right now have had COVID. Friends we know have been hospitalized. Some of our friends have passed away. But it's not just that. Our economy feels like it is in tatters and there is uncertainty and rough waters ahead. We, we need rain. We need lots of rain. Um, but that's not all. People who love this country are divided, forcefully divided. They've taken sides. They, they don't just disagree with people on the other side. They despise them. And we are as polarized now as I have ever seen in my entire life. And daily we're reading the newspapers where people on either side are threatening, they're getting into fistfights, they're, they're talking about the possibility of armed insurrection, a disdain of those who are in governance. Um, even, and I can't even believe that I'm saying this, but talk of secession from the Union. Father, you know I'm not making this prayer lightly. I'm making it because I am concerned for this country that was founded, at least with many people, from deep spiritual values. And I'm concerned because of what all of this is meaning for the institutions and the organizations that you have used to bless the world and to reach the world. And I'm concerned for the, the possibility of the United States backing away from being a force of being good and doing righteousness and pursuing justice in this world. No, we're not a perfect nation. No, we're, we're struggling with racism now, and it's becoming more apparent that, that we have turned a blind eye. I'm not, I'm not obscuring anything like that. But I know that I know that I know that we are a people who need to be in prayer. And I know that we are a people who are brokenhearted over what feels like the fragmentation of a great nation. And it's happening rapidly. And so we need your good guidance. We need you to, to move the hearts of people to be broken in prayer and submissive to your leadership. We need leadership that, that is not out to feather their own nest, but we need leadership that pursues righteousness and justice. We need humility, and the humility needs to start with us.
make it so in our lives. And may it ripple out from your people. And Father, I pray for those of us who are living right now trapped by fear. Fear that we might get COVID-19. Fear of, of the days ahead. Fear over our futures. And Father, may we together be the sort of hands and feet that alleviate fear, that alleviate misery, that restore peace, that rebuild community. And as we move from lament, thank goodness lament isn't the end of our story. It's the beginning of our story. And as we move from lament into the hope that we have this Christmas, Father, use the Christmas story and then use the songs that we will be singing to shape and form and, and develop our worship this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So like I said, I want to show you uh, something that is going to be familiar to a lot of you. Uh, you can probably even quote it along with the young gentleman as he says it. Charlie Brown's completely hopeless. Rat! You've been dumb before, Charlie Brown, but this time you really did it. <laughs> what a treat! <laughs> I guess you were right, Linus. I shouldn't have picked this little tree. Everything I do turns into a disaster. I guess I really don't know what Christmas is all about. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. This morning, we're going to light the first candle of our Advent wreath. God made some promises to his people a very long time ago. He promised that they would never be alone, that he would protect them and give them a future. But the greatest promise of all was that he would send someone to save them. So God's people waited for the promise to come true. They waited for a savior. They waited and waited and waited some more. The people who shared God's promises with his people were called prophets. One prophet named Isaiah had this to say. In Isaiah 7, 14, But the Lord will still give you proof. A virgin is pregnant, and she will have a son, and will name him Emmanuel. We all know what pregnant means, right? Yeah, it means to have a baby. So the promise from God that Isaiah shared was that this young woman was going to have a baby boy. So, Allison, would you like to light the first purple candle? So as we, it doesn't matter. Does it matter? I don't know if it matters. We're going to do this one. Okay. 
Do you know how to do that? Yeah, yeah. So as we light it, we're going to say together, God's people waited for the promise to come. God's people waited for the promise to come. Another prophet had, his, had this message from God. Bethlehem Ephrath, if you are, you are one of the smallest towns in the nation of Judah, but the Lord will choose one of your people to rule the nation, someone whose family goes back to ancient times. Micah 5.2. You guys have heard of Bethlehem, right? That's where Jesus was born. Different prophets told us that, G that God promised that in Bethlehem, a baby boy would be born. A baby boy that would be named Jesus and be the Savior. Do you think that God is, was going to keep his promise? Yes, but it took a very long time. That's why we're only lighting one candle today. We have to wait to light all of our candles, just like God's people had to wait for their Savior. So the people were waiting and waiting and waiting for their Savior. And then finally, they got to rejoice that God kept his promise. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for keeping your promise to send a Savior. Help us to wait for you this season and to rejoice in what you do in our lives. Amen. So I have some announcements today. Um, First of all, thank you for tuning in. Uh, welcome to everybody. Um, we won't be having our normal Christmas Eve service, uh, but we will be having a Christmas music night. That's this Friday, December 11th, from 6.30 to 8 p.m. And uh, please let us know if you have uh, any needs. Um, please email us or, or contact us. Um, don't forget about men's group on Tuesdays, prayer group on Wednesdays, and women's group on Thursdays. And if you need some information, you can go to our uh, website, lighthousewestsac.com. Um, and, and my phone just turned off. <laughs> and also the Teen Center, Collings Teen Center, they're distributing toys to students and families right now, today. Um, and Justin said that they really need five or six more volunteers today at 1 or 2 p.m. to help with the cleanup. And he said that that should go till, uh, shouldn't be any later than 5 p.m. Um, so if you'd like to help with that, contact Lena Hughes for more info. Or just go to City Hall, Lena says. Um, let's see, any more? Um, no. And uh, if you'd like to join me in prayer, I'd like to pray for Phil as he comes up. Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for the incredible blessings that you give to us each day. Um, we just pray that, um, and one of those blessings is, is Phil, our transitional pastor, and, and we thank you for you bringing him to us. And we pray that you will be with him as he gives a message today and just calm all of our hearts and prepare our hearts to receive that message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Yesterday I had fun, got to officiate at the wedding of, of Lizzie Lynch as she married Paul Edwards. Uh, Rick and Debbie's daughter, uh, yeah, it was downsized a little bit. I think there were only like 20 of us there, but it was such a, a, a nice time. I, I loved it. So uh, it's all my fault. We are one week behind in, ha in lighting the candles in the right order. I don't know what happened to me as I was looking at my December schedule, but it works out. Today we're going to be talking about the prophets. 
And we'd been talking about Paul, and I could go on and talk about Paul like forever. But during Christmas, I want to talk about some of the Christmas things. But here's what I want to do. I want to talk, I want to use passages that you wouldn't normally think of. Um, just new things. And by now you're picking that up a little bit. It's a weird quirk of my, my personality, my character, that I love always to look at things from kind of new directions. And so gang, with the, with the, with the uh, clicker, let's go ahead and, and get a, take a run at this. So when we hear the word prophet, uh, a lot of people don't have a biblical background for it anymore. So now when most people hear the word prophet, chances are they're thinking of something like this. The prophet Muhammad in Islam. For a lot of people, this is the closest thing that, that they really have as a framework for thinking about a prophet. You know, somebody who over the course of, of three or five years has these unique messages from God and they start religions. And that leads us to the next example of a prophet. Uh, Joseph Smith is known as a prophet. Our friends who are Latter-day Saints or Mormons, you, you see the top of the, uh, of the, it's not a cathedral, what do they call it? In, the temple, there we go, in Salt Lake City. And he claimed to be a prophet, uh, he believed that he had been given unique, separate plates by God by which to translate things. Um, showed it, as he said, to four or five other people. The problem is, is that it still doesn't get close, neither one of these get close to really what we, we mean when we talk about prophet in the Old Testament. Uh, and even a lot of us, when we think of prophet, we think of somebody who is like advanced in years and has kind of a, a, a tough demeanor, a look on their face, they, they, the look out of their eyes, they're calculating, they're, it's harsh. And the prophets were all about predicting the future, you know, looking into, as it were, God's crystal ball to figure out what the future was going to look like. And here's what I want to lay out to you. Even that doesn't actually get so close to what the prophets were in the Old Testament. Prophets were all about spiritual leadership. And leadership, the guidance of God's people in the Old Testament, it broke apart to these two, these two groups. The first were the priests. And the priests were never really about teaching the scriptures. That really wasn't their role. The role of the priests was the ritual. It was... Uh, keeping everything going in the tabernacle or the temple, keeping the sacrifices going. Their job was not so much to teach the morality, to teach the spirituality of the people, but to keep it going. It was the role of the prophets who spoke to the conscience and to work for justice for God's people and work for justice actually in the world. So, do you understand that there were the, those two different dimensions, the priests and the prophets? The prophets were really the conscience, the spiritual conscience of the people. Uh, they would be, there were individual prophets. We think of Isaiah, uh, we think of Jeremiah. But also, a lot of the prophets were part of what were called the schools of the prophets. So you would have a, a, a significant teacher, a leader, and they would gather around them their students. And when we think of prophets in the Old Testament, almost everything we think of is always about making predictions about the future. That is a bit of a faulty view. Where they were going is to speak to the spiritual lives of God's people now and to prepare them for the future. And so they would use prophecies a short-term prophecy and a long-term prophecy to get people ready. But what they were trying to do with that is so that, the, is so that God's people would live and operate with God's mercy and justice right now. So they always had maybe that long-term view, but what they're really concerned about is right now, how are we living and acting and, 
And who are we as God's people? There was always this present dimension to it. So that's why I put those, those arrows right at the bottom of that. They had this responsibility to talk about, okay, everybody, how's our relationship with God? And then how is our righteousness? How are we doing with each other? Both of those were going on at the same time. There were some of the prophets in the north. There were some of the prophets in the south. And even in the Babylonian exile, you know, all the way to Babylon, there were prophets at work there. And that's one of the prophets. It's going to be that prophet that we're going to be looking at today. But before I take you there, and it's going to be the, to Isaiah 41 when we go, um, I want to talk about courtroom shows, right? Here are some of the courtroom scene, courtroom shows that, that you might know from your background. Of course, there's Perry Mason. If you're of a certain age, you'll, rep, you'll recognize that guy. I don't personally, but I've heard about him, okay? Uh, L.A. Law was a big one. Uh, suits. We could, we could keep going down the line. Um, we love courtroom scenes. We do. And that isn't new. That's, people have been fascinated by justice and courtroom scenes going back into history. Still, even more recent days, in Arab cultures, the, the sheikh, the, the guy in charge of the village, the guy in charge of the region, once a week, he will have an open courtroom that anybody can come and bring their issues before him. Even the, the major people in charge of Saudi Arabia, they make sure that there is open courtroom, and in an age when there's not Netflix, everybody wants to come and figure out how he's going to rule on, on different family situations or when somebody's goat ate somebody's whatever. Everybody's kind of involved in all of that. Well, what we do when we come to Scripture, we've got situations that are courtroom scenes. And they're kind of gripping. And in Isaiah 41, it's this amazing courtroom scene where here are all of these people stuck in Babylon. And they're kind of angry at God. And so it sets up this courtroom situation where people are going, God, have you forgotten us here? We are 700 miles away from our homes. We've lost our livelihoods. Have you forgotten us? Are you done with us? You're not treating us fairly. What did we do to ever deserve this? And it's a courtroom scene, Isaiah 41. And God is the one in the dock. Uh, doc is the word used in England for the, the accused. They're accusing God. But what God does is that he flips it. And he gives, it, and he presents a counter charge. And he accuses them of idolatry. Now most of the time when we hear the words idolatry, what do we think of? Oh, the little brass statue on your, on your shelf or the little thing that you, that you burn incense to every day. Usually that's how we think of idolatry. But already by the time of Isaiah, they were moving past that and idols were the things that you loved more than God. It was about your affections. I'm not looking at the camera enough. Sorry about that. Okay, I'll look at the camera more. See, I just, these folks out here are so good looking. If you saw what I saw, they were just mesmerizing. So now, uh, I'm back with you because I'm picturing that you're all there and equally attractive and beautiful and handsome and good looking. Okay, how is that for being political? Oh my goodness. So I was getting wrapped up there. But, so, courtroom scene. People are angry at God. There's a prosecuting attorney, and God says, no, let me speak to my own defense. All of this that you're seeing, you've got a part in it. It's idolatry. It's that you've fallen in love with things that have taken over your life, and so you don't have the capacity to honor me and walk with me. Because what does God want? 
Is God just wanting people going, I love you, God, I love you, God, I love you, God? No, 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 no. What God wants is relationship. And he's saying that what you've fallen for are things that have somehow watered down any real relationship with me. You're turning to them. You're putting your hopes in that stuff rather than hopes in me. And as a result, if there's no relationship, my protective hands over you, well, I'm just going to put my hands down to my side and let what happened happen to you. No, I did not cause your exile to Babylon. But if you've forgotten me, if you have no need for relationship with me, I'm going to let the stuff just Here is where the story takes a fascinating, fascinating turn. And this is something that you may or may not have uh, really heard before. But what Isaiah is going to do, in typical prophet fashion, uh, fashion he's going to give a short-term prediction and then in, include a long-term prophecy. So it starts in verse 25. And he says, I have stirred up completed action. I have stirred up one from the north and he comes. One from the rising sun who calls on my name. He treads on rulers as if they were mortar. You know, the stuff between bricks. Yeah, he treads on that stuff. And, and, and if he were a potter treading on the clay. So how does a potter get the clay ready? Yeah, well, he gets the dirt, gets it wet, and then just tromps on it. Isaiah is saying, yeah, there is that guy who is coming. Okay? Why? And he says, because I look and there is no one among them to give counsel. No one to answer when I ask them. What's his point? His point is, is that your idolatry as a people... You now have no counselors. You, know how, you no longer have people to answer when I call. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring forth a new Messiah, a short-term Messiah and a long-term Messiah. And they're going, really? Where and, and, and what? He's pointing to somebody from Iran called Cyrus. It's the only time in the entire Old Testament that a non-Jew is called a Messiah. And Cyrus is going to be the guy who finally sends the children of Israel back to Israel. He gives them money to rebuild their temple. He sends some of his people, and he becomes known as this great, Ruler that God is going to use. Amazingly, God calls him his Messiah, his anointed one. But there is always a short term and a long term. Because while there is an initial Messiah, a Cyprus, a Cyrus sort of person, there is going to be someone who takes it even further. Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4. Here is my servant who I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. Now, before I go any further, folks, i got to say, this is fascinating, that God would say that there is someone who is not a Jew who I delight, who I will put my spirit on him. We were talking about this in our class, Discipleship Pathways, earlier today. The emphasis on God's heart for the nations. And this is pretty staggering. That even at this stage, God says, no, I'm going to use someone you would never imagine. I am going to use a secular leader. I will put my spirit on him, and he is going to bring justice to the nations because... I care about justice for the nations. Amazing. 
He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Uh, Phil, I don't... I, what, what's he mean there? That means that he's not going to be a dictator, a, a hard person who destroys people. Instead, he builds them up. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. What does that mean? Well, when it talks about islands in Isaiah, what it's talking about people who live on the coastline and on some of those little islands right off the coast because they were the ones who were most vulnerable for, from foreign armies coming in. And he's saying, even the people who live on the coastline are going to be able to live in peace. The people who live in Santa Barbara and San Francisco, yeah, even them, they're going to be able to live in peace. Now, what's so interesting about that, for the Jews, all of a the sudden they're understanding that our God is not a little local territorial God. And for most people, that's how they viewed it, that there would be a God over Sacramento County and a God over Yolo County and a God over Plumas County. And what we're seeing here is, is Isaiah saying, no, this is a God who has a great purpose of blessing the nations. And he's not above using somebody who you might have originally seen as your enemy, but God will use them to bring about, what does he care about? To bring about justice for people. And there's going to be a short-term Messiah, Cyrus, and then there's going to be a long-term Messiah, the one who will actually bring about God's justice and fulfillment. What makes this so great is that, well, before I go there, let me show you this too. I, I, I love it. Isaiah 42, same sort of courtroom scene, right? We have not moved away from it. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to his people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. And righteousness doesn't mean, oh, he keeps all of the rules. Nope. Righteousness meant a person who lives aligned with God and in right relationship with his neighbors. What was Joseph known as? He was known as a righteous man. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. Here we go again. This idea of God's concern for Gentiles, and Gentiles means peoples. Another word for it is the nations. I will make you the future Messiah to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open the eyes that are blind, to free the captives from prison and to release from dungeon those who sit in darkness so at this point I want to jump ahead almost 600 years six centuries and I want to take you to this place this is an old photo and I love old photos like from a hundred years ago of places like this you see that somebody wrote at the bottom of the photo Nazareth you know, in, in, in little white paint. And, and somehow, I guess, this is how people made notations of the places that they'd been to. This is Nazareth from um, probably around 1910, 1920. If you saw it today, it, it's all covered, jammed, and, and it looks nothing like this. When it's this size, it's not that different than what it would have been in the days of Jesus. Nazareth was a town... No, it was not a town. It was a village 
of about two football fields. 300 people, not very large. And what you're seeing there is maybe four or five football fields, but not much more than that. Nazareth had been essentially unchanged for a couple thousand years. Here's another uh, artist's rendition of what Nazareth would have been like. And quite often, the, the homes, the buildings of Nazareth, they were built back into caves. So, for example, um, Joseph and Mary, when they returned to Nazareth, their home probably had a stone front to it, but it was built back into a cave. So, Luke chapter 4. Jesus has had some notoriety. He's been baptized by John. He's been teaching. He's been slowly assembling some of the first disciples. And he's done some miracles. Well, small little Nazareth, local boy made good, comes home. And, of course, on Sabbath day, we want him to stand up and speak, right? And that's a big deal. So I imagine their synagogue was something like this. Um, small little dark room. And in the middle of the synagogue inside there would be the Bema. The, we talked about it last week. It, it's two to three feet, two by three feet. And there comes a point in a typical synagogue service when uh, the Old Testament, when the Torah uh, is supposed to be read, and the person in charge of the synagogue brings over to you the scrolls for that day. And you're to stand up and you're to read from them. But you, before you do, you stand up and you kiss the scrolls and you lay them down and you begin to read. So let me read that situation to you from Luke chapter 4. So it's probably fairly dark inside that room. Um, it's candlelit. How many people would be, would be at synagogue? Well, if the town is only 300 people, half of those are men. Uh, are male. A smaller part of that would have been men. And because there's not a lot of other things to do on a, Sunday, uh, on a Saturday morning in Nazareth, and Nazareth is known as an observant or a very religious village, you're probably looking at, oh, I don't know, 30, 40 men tops probably in there. So they're all packed in. Somebody has lit the incense, and if you've ever been in a room full of incense, you know that it's smoky, and it smells like lots of bad perfume, you know, cheap perfume. And, but, you know, it's all part of your life, and Jesus is here. Maybe that's a reason they had more people than normal there that particular Saturday. Jesus returned to the Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him, uh, verse 14, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. Now, the inside of synagogues, uh, they don't sit like this. They sit around the corners of the room, uh, around the perimeter of the room. If there are ladies, um, if you're there, there is a screen, and ladies sit behind it. If it is a larger synagogue, maybe ladies, there is a second, there, there's a balcony for you up there. Nazareth, probably on the small side, probably poor people. So if there are any ladies there at all, you're behind the screen, maybe over in the corner. But again, you get the picture, right? Here's a guy sitting around the perimeter of the room. They're talking sheep. They're talking wet. They, they do what farmers have been doing for thousands of years. Talking sheep, talking the projects, talking hobbies. 
they start with the song, they start with the candles, and there's kind of a bit of excitement in the air because Jesus, Jesus is here. And as was the custom, he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was, handled, was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue, they were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, at this, everybody's loving him. Local boy, made good. And he's telling us the future is in front of us right here. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they said? Now, as an aside, they didn't say, isn't this Mary's son? Uh-uh. He's known as Joseph's boy. And they want, now, they're all waiting to hear. Okay, let's hear the commentary. Let's see what he's going to say on this one. So far, so good. He's read Isaiah 41 and 42. And Jesus said to them, Surely you quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Do hear in your hometown what you've heard that you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth. The, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time. When the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elijah and the pro Elijah the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Now, get the scene. This is important. Everything that Jesus had done is saying, essentially, I am the person, and it's time to bring about all of those promises given to Isaiah. They're down with that. Why do they get upset? Why the anger? Because Jesus is saying, in my ministry, I'm not just going to be focusing on you. My sights, my ministry is going to go to justice for those outside of Israel as well. That's what they can't handle. Because they believe that they were the chosen people of God and if God is going to do anything then he's for sure going to do it amongst us. But just like with, Cy with Cyrus before, that God was getting ready to work in a new way through a secular leader, Jesus is saying, I'm the Messiah, and I am getting ready to do something that isn't necessarily going to set you aside. But God's heart is so for justice in this world that you may be bothered when I go and I work with people way beyond what you can imagine. With Syrians. What? God cares about Syrians? They're our enemy. Yeah. And with people with leprosy, who, whose disease makes them abhor abhorrent to us, yeah, I'm going to be working with them too. Oh my goodness. They've got to take this in because this is not what they were expecting the Messiah to do. They were expecting the Messiah to be a King David. Somebody to come in with guns blazing and horses and, and take back political territory. And 
Jesus is saying, no, that's not what I'm called to do. That's not what I'm to be about. We are called to be pursuing justice. We are being called to offer kindness to those who are not us, those who don't look like us, those who don't speak the same language. Now, we talk about Jesus being a prophet and a priest and a king, right? Those are going to be his three assignments. But when you come back and you really look at how they understood the word prophet. Jesus is perfectly, perfectly in the line of an Old Testament prophet speaking to the people of God saying, what our God calls for is a profound concern for peoples of all nations. God's heart is for the entire world, not just a small little subset of it. And God may be doing things and reaching people that we may not have anticipated at all. And God is at work in the lives of people. Maybe on your street, maybe in your school, maybe those with whom you work. And you don't even realize that he is at work in their lives yet. But God cares for all the peoples on the earth. Case in point, um, we have some friends who were um, foreign workers in Turkey for almost 20 years. And there can be a, a very strong us versus them when you're working in a culture that is so heavily involved in another religion. Um, in Turkey, it is something like 98% Muslim. And you can tend to think that, man, God isn't doing anything here, and this is, this is hard. But one particular day, they heard a knock on their door, and they opened the door, and the man says, um, hello, we've not met before. Um, but I live over in this particular city, well, it was six hours away by bus. And I have been having a recurrent dream of Isha. And in this dream, he tells me that I need to go to Istanbul to hear, to find someone who can tell me about Isha. So finally, not knowing anything else to do, I came here to Isa. I came here to Istanbul, and met people. And those people told me about others, who told me about others, who told me about you. Can you tell me about Isa? Can you tell me about Jesus? Because that's what Jesus means in Arabic is Isa. And that opened up a whole new mindset for them that God is working in the lives of people that we may not even know about yet. That God is not limited by borders. God is not limited by um, economic systems. God is at work. So how I would bring this down to a conclusion for us today is first of all, on one hand, this tells us about what God cares about. God cares profoundly about justice in this world. He cares about mercy, and, and the church needs to be involved in that. But stretching it out beyond that, what I tell people often is that God has brought the world to our doorstep here. And there are people maybe living on your street, maybe in your school, maybe you're working with them, and, and it feels like, well, they're of a different religion. Um, we don't really have anything to share in that, so I just keep my views to myself. I understand that. I've, I've done that. 
But I want you to lean outside of that a little bit and take a bit of a faith-filled risk with me. And what I want you to do is to do two things, two simple steps. And you can do it with people who are your waiters at restaurants if you're eating outside. You can do it with, with clerks. You can do it with friends. But I want you to do two things. Number one, I want you to just um, ask them a little bit of their story. If it's pretty clear by their language that English is not their first language, can you say just this? Um, what's your home country? Tell me about your home country. It's an easy question. Can you do that? Yeah, I think all of you, I think all of us could do that. Here's the second one. I want you to say, um, I know it's hard coming into a country like this. Can I pray for you? And you go, well, I could never do something like that. Yes, you can. And here's the thing that you need to understand. We get so used to using prayer language among ourselves that, that it really does not count for that much. But when you say something like that, to a person who has a Hindu background, someone who has an Islamic background, someone who has a Zoroastrian background, when they hear that you as a person are willing to pray for them, it builds a bridge. Or maybe you can even say, to take it even a step further on that question, you could even say, is there anything I could pray for you on? And I can tell you what will happen. There will be like, a 10 count, where they're going to have to really think about it. But don't think for a moment that they are offended by that. It is just the opposite. How they will interpret it is, this person cares about me. They care about my life. I've not asked you to do anything that is weird to them. They will embrace it, they will value it, and they will feel almost like it is that step of justice that includes them. Two things. Where's your home country? Tell me a little bit about it. I'd love to hear more. Second, can I pray for you? Or is there anything I can pray for? My promise is, if you try those, you're going to come back and you're going to go, Bill, I can't believe the door that it opened. It sparked a relationship. And when that happens, then it enlarges our understanding of just where God has put us. Because frankly, West Sac is this amazing place for where God has brought the world to our doorstep right here. And rather than seeing it as, as something uncomfortable and, and it's changing in front of us, it's exactly the opposite. We begin to see ourselves as, you know what? A lighthouse. A place right here for God's purposes. Make sense? Yeah. God has called us. God is inviting us in his ministry of prophecy. Not in predicting the future, but in being who we need to be right now living out his justice, offering justice and mercy for people that he cares about who have probably gone through really, really hard times of leaving home, feeling like they don't fit, wondering if they are welcome here. You do just those two questions, and it changes things. All right, team, come on up, and, and then I think your next song, I can't wait to hear it. I, I know what we're, we're doing, we're, we're just showing you the, the slides while the team sings, but uh, I am so thankful, oh my goodness, for, for these folks because there is a sweetness as they lead us. God bless you, team. And um, I guess I'm telling you that 
that while you're not able to be here, they're still here and they're preparing us for the future and the quality of their leading us in our lives. I just appreciate it so much. So thank you, team. Let's sing. Micah 6, 8 says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Lord, as we depart today, may we, as we enter this crazy Christmas season of 2020, may we remember that that your hope has come because of Emmanuel. But because of that hope, we can go into our world and be hope to, to the nations. That we will act justly and to love mercy and walk humbly with you as we come in contact with people that are fearful, people that are hurting, people that are feeling very alone. Lord, may your, may the hope of this Advent season be carried into our hopeless situations of COVID-19. May we have a peace that surpasses all understanding, and may we long for justice that we feel is, is so lacking. May we know that that is found only in your presence. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this time that we were able to spend in your word and in your presence today. And as we depart into our weeks, Lord, may, may your truth and your hope and your justice be deep in our hearts. We pray these things in your name. Amen.